I, I feel so lucky to have um, gotten to, um, to do for my, to, for my work, for my livelihood, what I love to do for the last 39 years, um, namely tell stories. Um, that there's actually, there's only one aspect of, of my work that I, um, that I regret, and that's how unsociable it is, and I'm a very sociable person. Uh, unlike a lot of writers, actually, I really, I love to go out into the world and make friends, and it's not really possible to be doing that and writing books. So my great reward after writing a book or two um, is to have an evening like this, an afternoon like this with you. So my favorite part will be hearing from you, and I, I want to be sure and leave plenty of time for that portion of this hour. Um, so please don't disappoint me, and we can talk about absolutely anything. Um, I, you know, I, I had a novel published last summer called The Good Daughters, and I may or may not even mention that one. I've published 12 books, and I'm happy to talk about um, memoir, fiction, um, pie making, um, um, growing older, um, increasingly you know, a theme for, many of, for, for all of our lives, in a sense. Um, but I thought I'd begin by giving you a little bit of um, a description of, of how I came to be a writer myself. Um, and I find that whatever else varies when I speak, the first sentence I speak in introducing my story is invariably the same. Um, and I always begin by saying, I grew up in an alcoholic family. Um, and there were two very distinct um, sources of pain and trouble in that. And only one was the fact that my father got drunk every night. And probably the even larger one was the keeping of the secret of the fact that my father got drunk every night. Um, and when I look over my life's work over the last 39 years and consider what the themes are that I go back to again and again, it is secrets. It is the, the enormously damaging effect of secrets. Um, I, I have been um, uh, uh, criticized and sometimes condemned um, myself for being um, a person who speaks pretty openly about things that we have sometimes been told we're not supposed to talk about. Um, and I know that I, I do that in reaction to having grown up with a very large and unmentionable secret um, and that was a very scary thing. Um, I adored my parents. Um, my, my parents were both extraordinarily talented uh, people in their own right, but also deeply frustrated in their artistic lives. My father was a painter whose um, paintings were seen by nobody but our family for, for all of the years that I grew up in that household. My mother um, was a, a gloriously gifted writer, um, and performer. She was a very theatrical woman, daughter of Russian immigrant Jews, um, who, who had really struggled to send her to college. And she had earned a PhD at Harvard um, at a time when women didn't get to do that very much, and found herself as a wife and mother of the 1950s unemployable. Um, she sold encyclopedias door to door and tutored Latin for a dollar an hour, because that was the only work she could find. And so, like a lot of the daughters of my generation, I was born in 1953, I was my mother's career. Um, I was my mother's greatest product. And um, she, both of my parents, for different reasons, invested huge energy and hope in my own aspirations, uh, which were really for them. Um, there's a, a Yiddish word, nachef, um, and it is, it is the honor that you lay at the feet of your parents. And um, uh, I, I cannot remember ever being so young that I didn't know that it was my responsibility to, to win the recognition um, that had eluded my richly deserving parents. So I also can't remember um, a time when I didn't write. And, and even when I couldn't physically write, I gave dictation. And my mother took my writing seriously and wrote everything down and typed it up and sent it off to magazines. I, I may be the first person ever in the Aspen Foundation series who was first published in Humpty Dumpty magazine. <laughs> um, and then Junior Scholastic and Seventeen. Um, and I always felt driven to, to produce success for my parents. Um, I've worked with many editors and very famous editors in New York City. I have never, I have never had my work um, 
uh, critiqued by any editor more stern and demanding than my mother and my father in our living room in Durham, New Hampshire for the first 17 years of my life. Um, in my freshman year at college, um, Yale, it was very important that I lay a, uh, a good college education at my parents' feet as well. Um, I sent off a letter to the editor-in-chief of the New York Times suggesting that I write for him and enclosing some clippings for my work. And I have to add, if this sounds pretty brazen, I couldn't have called up a boy to save my life. That would have been very scary. But I could send a letter to the editor-in-chief of the New York Times. And interestingly, he wrote back and said, OK, and gave me an assignment to write the absolutely the only story that I was um, equipped to write, which was a story about myself. Um, this was 1972, and I got the assignment to grow, uh, to, to write a piece about growing up in the 60s. And I went, I took the bus home from New Haven for a weekend and sat on my childhood bed and went down to my living room to read out loud to my parents my story. And about three weeks later, there was a big full color photograph of me in my jeans um, sitting um, on the floor of the Yale Library and a, a title across the front of the New York Times Magazine section. Um, I didn't get the irony of this title at the time because I was just 18. An 18 year old looks back on life. <laughs> well, um, within three days of the publication of that story, my life as a small town girl from New Hampshire, trying desperately to hit the big city and, and achieve all sorts of recognition for my parents, um, were fulfilled in more than I could have imagined. There were three enormous sacks of mail um, laid at the steps of my Yale um, dormitory room with offers to um, go and meet with magazine editors and newspaper editors and have lunch with, with publishers, um, fly to Hollywood. My favorite was an invitation to audition for The Exorcist, which was being <laughs> cast at the time. And obviously, I didn't get the part. Um, but, um, but in among those many letters, um, uh, another of my favorites was to, mo to model clothes for Mademoiselle magazine. Um, um, in among those many letters was one completely different from all the rest, single space typewritten one page, saying, I bet you're sitting in your dormitory room right now, um, surrounded by invitations from uh, editors and publishers and people wanting you to have lunch with them in New York and model clothes for Mademoiselle magazine. And I just want to urge you to be careful. There's some irony in these words, too. They, um, the, the writer of the letter went on to say, I happen to think that you're a really good writer, and I urge you to be very careful. You will be exploited. Um, the writer went on to say some very endearing and tender and funny things that um, allowed me to view him as a person who knew me in a unique way. I had felt for all those years of growing up with the big, shameful secret of my father's drinking, not even a secret of my own making, that nobody really knew me. I was trying so hard to be this perfect, accomplished girl. And here was this person who seemed to know me. And, and, and I was not unique among American teenagers over now a number of generations in responding to that voice that way. Here is the one person who really understands me. So that by the time I got to the signature at the bottom of the letter, um, I truly found a, felt that I had found a friend. And the signature was that of J.D. Salinger. Um, and you know, what moved me to respond to the letter was not that signature. I think, actually, my 18-year-old self would have been more impressed and excited if I'd gotten a letter from John Lennon or Bob Dylan. Um, <laughs> but um, it was the voice in that letter and the funny, tender, knowing voice. And so we became pen pals. And within a, um, a week, I, all the rest of my life at college, um, faded away and I lived for the hour when I knew the mail would be delivered to the Yale post office and I would get my letter, which really was like getting your own personal letter from Holden Caulfield, telling you that you were the most perfect girl in the world. It was a pretty heady thing. And when June came in the end of my freshman year, no big surprise that I took a bus up to um, ha Hanover, New Hampshire, and met the man who by that point had become um, not simply one of the most important people in my world, but the only person in my world. I viewed him as my mentor, my friend, my spiritual guide, and um, was not really expecting to be viewed as anything but a friend back. Um, I was, 
I was very um, knowledgeable about having meetings with editors of, new, of uh, Seventeen magazine and not at all about the things of the world. I was a particularly young 18-year-old girl in many ways. But within a couple of months, I had given up my full scholarship at Yale and withdrawn from college, never went back. And you have a college dropout before you. Um, and had moved in with Jerry Salinger. Um, I also had a, a book contract by that time to write um, my first crack at the story of my life, a memoir um, um, that I was engaged in writing for most of the following year um, with strict instructions to finish quickly before I got too old, meaning 19. Um, but I wrote that book, it's called Looking Back, um, with a lot of ambivalence because I knew that it was a project that the man I so adored and revered um, despised. And so in the 160 pages of my first attempt at telling the story of my life, you will not find any mention of the fact that I grew up in an alcoholic family, that I had dropped out of my Ivy League college to live with a 53-year-old man, or that that 53-year-old man happened to be Salinger. Um, and I think if the book had been 162 pages, I wouldn't have gotten to it then either because I was still a person living with deep shame and deep fear of telling the truth and belief that nobody would like me if I did, certainly not the man whose approval mattered more to me than anybody's. But three weeks before the publication of that book in the spring of 1973, um, uh, with an abruptness um, greater um, than his entry into my life, Salinger on a trip to Florida with him and his children who were just a couple years younger than me, um, put a $50 bill in my hand and told me to go away and not come back. Um, and you know, um, I always say about this, one of the many differences between being a 19-year-old girl and a 57-year-old woman is that um, if a man said to me some of the things that, that that man I so loved and admired said to me that day, if a man said those things to me now, I would think less of the man. But when a 19-year-old girl um, who adores and worships somebody as the only religion she ever knew um, says that she is a, a, a human being not worthy um, and beneath contempt, she thinks less of herself. Um, so the girl who got on that plane that day was a pretty destroyed person. And, and um, I went back to New Hampshire. I did not go back to college. I did continue to write. I've never stopped writing in 39 years. But I, I don't think that I felt like a worthy individual for a very long time. And I continue to believe that um, I, having lost the respect of the person whose approval I wanted most, um, that I, I had no opportunity to ever know joy or, or um, artistic achievement again. Um, I did continue to work. Um, I eventually went to New York <coughs> City, got a job as a reporter at the New York Times, married an age-appropriate man, had children. Um, lived in a farm in New Hampshire and raised the children. The children were a great idea. The marriage did not survive. And, I, and over the years, one of the wonderful gifts of my writing life was that as I began to write, and I wrote, um, I, I wrote often about my life because as was true when I was a teenager, that was the only story I really had access to. I was raising little children in a farmhouse at the end of a dead-end road, and I became a, a reporter on my life. Um, and I, I, I felt it was very important when I did publish my stories and eventually a newspaper column that was syndicated pretty widely about my experiences in my young and struggling family that I not leave some girl, some woman, some mother, wife, fellow human being out there feeling as I had when I was growing up like a, a deeply shamed person that I was, I truly believed when I was growing up I was the only person in the world whose father got drunk. I didn't know that happened in any other family. And I wanted to talk about the truth of less than perfect life and the many failings of the, the dream that I had attempted to construct in my marriage and my home. Um, and as my marriage began to fall apart, um, I could not do anything but tell the story of that as well. Um, and then I went on to write the story of being a single parent, struggling with raising three children in a very imperfect life. And, um, 
And over the years um, of my writing life in my 20s and then in my 30s and into my 40s, um, I became a lot braver about telling the truth. And the reason really was readers. Readers writing to me and invariably telling me um, that they too, they shared my experiences. I was actually much closer and more connected to readers when I dared to tell the story of the flawed life, not the perfect life, not the golden girl that I tried to be when I was 18. But there remained one story that, among all the others, I never told out of a continued um, uh, belief in the obligation to maintain the privacy, though I might call it secrecy, of the great man whose, whose teachings and direction of my life had shaped me so much when I was young. Um, I felt an obligation to never speak of Salinger, and he had made it very plain um, that that was my code, and I, and I adhere to it for a very long time. It's a code that many people continue to believe um, um, he, even after death, should enjoy. Um, and when I name the turning point in my, um, my attitude to telling that story, even when I viewed myself as a, as a, as a truth-telling writer, my, my preservation of that one secret, the turning point came when my own oldest daughter, Audrey, turned 18, the age that I was when everything changed in my life. And I, where always before my great loyalty to protect had been with the great important man, so much more important than I. When Audrey turned that age and I pictured her going out into the world as I had and pictured her experiencing some of the things that I had, my loyalty and sense of protection shifted to the young girl. And I felt a kind of ferocious need to protect that I had never given to myself. Um, and I decided to write the true story of my life. Um, and not just, you know, this, this book, At Home in the World, which I, um, was actually written 12 years ago now, 13 years ago. Um, I've written a lot of them since. Um, um, is sometimes, sometimes people will say, oh, you're the one who wrote the book about Salinger. And I always say, actually, no. I wrote a book about myself. Um, but Salinger played a part in my story, and I chose not to exclude him from that story. Um, so I spent, it was the hardest story I ever told. It was a, a brutally painful thing to re-immerse myself in the telling of that story. And I, when it was published in the fall of 1998, I, I was pretty naive, although I was by this time in my 40s and had raised three children. Um, and endured the deaths of my parents and a very bitter and difficult divorce, um, I, I truly believed that there was safety in simple truth-telling. That if I, if I simply laid out what happened without vengeance or bitterness, um, that I would be understood. And, and I guess I, I continue, and I, if, this, if this view hasn't changed even to the age of 57, it probably isn't going to change, to believe that, that that finally life is too complicated if you do anything other than simply tell the truth. Um, but when this book was published, it was pretty universally condemned. I, I, I take a certain pride in the fact that the Washington Post called this the worst <laughs> book ever published. Um, <laughs> Time Magazine, the critic for Time Magazine said, the one good thing about At Home in the World is we'll never have to hear from Joyce Maynard again. Um, and actually, that was a wonderful thing to hear because I knew, reading those words, that that would not be the case. This was not my last story. This was my first story. And that it would free me to tell all the others that, I, that had been locked in me because I was holding on to a big secret. Um, so I'm happy to say that there have been, I think, five novels since At Home in the World. And, and uh, they're, they're books that I'm, I'm proud of. They all, they're, they're stories that um, in one way or another continue to explore the issues and obsessions that I care about. I don't think that that changes, whether I'm writing memoir, as I have a couple of times, and, and in hundreds of essays or fiction. I'm always interested in the truth of what happens between men and women, parents and children, brothers and sisters, families. Um, 
people will ask me, you know, what kind of books do you write? And I'll be sitting on a plane, and I get, and they, you know, they're they're thinking like mystery, thriller, romance, and I, I, the, the best that I can do is to say I write about the drama of human relationships and the danger of secrets between human beings. Um, so um, I could say a whole lot more, but I'm. Um, and, and if you're very shy and quiet, I'll start talking again. But I'd so much rather, um, and I can read, I, I love to read, but, but I'd s my, my first choice is to hear absolutely whatever, whatever is on your mind. So um, please give me that gift. Yes? Oh, well, thank you. I, I've only gotten to do it twice. Um, one part, if, if, you, if you've supported a family as a writer, one part of it is not hard at all. <laughs> um, my, my novel, To Die For, um, was made into a film some years back. It's actually, I think it's one of Nicole Kidman's best performances. And I was very lucky that I think a good film got made. But you know, I think you have to let go of your book when a movie is being made. In the same way that eventually you have to let go of your children. You control them up to a point, to a point even, not, not entirely ever. But, but then you send them out into the world, and that's how I felt about To Die For, and it was a lucky uh, bonanza that a good movie was made even more so that I got to be in it. I play Nicole Kidman's lawyer, which you might not know unless you sort of were looking for me. Um, and I'm happy to say that my book, Labor Day, which is one back from the newest one, looks like it's going to uh, begin shooting this, this summer. And I'm really excited about that because the director of that one, um, Jason Reitman, is probably the director I would have chosen for that book. Um, um, so no, I, I, I'll tell you the one book that would be very hard to to see made into a film, and I'm very protective of this one, and, and I've said no to a number of people, and that is At Home in the World. Um, I, I think it could be a wonderful film, but, but to see one's own story told on the screen um, would require a different sort of, of trust and faith in the filmmaker, and, and that hasn't happened yet, but maybe someday. Yeah. That you've just given away your age. Yeah. <laughs> and it just blew me away. And I think huh. my husband really, you won't believe what you grow most. You know, I took you to a party for two years ago. And so it's a great thrill to see you. Oh, thank you. And I mean, it would have been maybe so much different if you just had another little book to write. And it was just so exquisite. You know, you were on a cloud with your own team. And you know, I didn't mention it in that article because I was, I was a real good girl. And I would never have exposed my body that way. Part of what I learned in writing the true story is that if you write out of love and compassion, telling the truth is, is not an act of vengeance or an act of waging war. Um, my, my parents are, are revealed in this book, as, as, as those of you who've read it may know, as, as people who, have, who, who made some terrible mistakes including you know, delivering me, my mother really, my mother sewed the dress I wore to meet with Salinger. I think if it had been any other 53-year-old man, she would have viewed that very differently. But, but um, the fact that I had won the, the approval and uh, admiration of such an important man conferred a kind of importance on her. Um, uh, there were my, father, my father's drinking and my father's rages are very much, my father's depression is very much revealed in this book. And P.S., I adored my father. And, and part of the truth, I think, about good, honest writing is that there are no villains, that it is the job of a writer to locate compassion for every single character. This is true when I'm writing memoir and when I'm writing fiction. There are no simple bad guys in, in the stories that I want to tell. And that, that includes um, my ex-husband. That includes J.B. Salinger. Um, everybody has a story. That's that's what I would write over my, if I, if I got a tattoo, that's what it would be. <laughs> Everybody's got their story. And it's my job to, yes. It's always so exciting to see a man at one of these events. They, <laughs> no offense to the women. I love to meet with the women. But, but it's the brave men who come to 5.30 writer talks when you could be out watching some sporting event. Yes. Oh, what an interesting question. Um, how, the question was how aging has affected my memory and if we fictionalize. I don't, um, 
I will say, not to brag, but I think partly because the discipline of being a writer for as long as I have um, gives me a pretty good memory for important things. But having said that, I will add that there is a danger, and I don't think it's, for me, connected with age. It's connected also with my line of work. That sometimes I, stop, I, I have to ask myself, am I remembering what really happened, or am I remembering, my children accuse me of this sometimes, the story that I've told? And the stories become the truth. It's a dangerous phenomenon for a writer. Um, sometimes I'll be talking on the phone with my daughter Audrey, and she'll say, "You've told this story before, haven't you, Mom?" Because I'm a good storyteller, and I, a, as was my mother, and 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 I get my story down to the point of you know the beats of it even, and I, and um, and I'll be sort of shamed to say, "Yes, I have actually. I've been telling this story to my friends." Um, so. I don't think we forget the really important things. Um, they're in us. I, I don't think we run into somebody on the street that, that was our, our beloved 30 years before and, and fail to remember whether, w whether they broke our heart or not. I, I think the feelings endure, and, the, and some of the details in particular do fade. But um, you know, it was an interesting thing in writing at home in the world. I, I believed when I embarked on this book that I'd had about five pages to, to write about the year I spent in a house in Portage, New Hampshire with the man that I thought I would spend the rest of my life with. I didn't really, I wasn't very good at math. Um, <laughs> um, and it was only when I locked myself in, I practically did, I went up to a little cabin in Oregon to write this book that memory <coughs> returned to me more than I could have known. And I think that's true for all of us. I, I you know, one of my great joys now is to teach memoir. I love to teach writing, and I, I'm the daughter of two extraordinary teachers, and my favorite kind of writing to teach is memoir. I, 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 I run a, a memoir workshop every summer, um, and sometimes in the winter, and, and I love to help other people, whether they aspire to be professional writers or just want to tell a story, tell their story well. And one of the thrilling things is to see the way memory comes back when you give space to it. Um, so I'm not forgetful, no. Do me wrong and I'll remember forever. <laughs> Do me right and I will too. <laughs> yeah. No, and I, I, you know, and I'm sure I, if you've been to other of these talks, um, I, I'm sure one of the great, I, I would love to hear what everybody else would say about that because I think it's very particular to the writer. So I will certainly not suggest that this is like, you know, the way to do it. This is just the way I do it. I have to tell you, the day before I have started every novel that I've ever written, and there are now eight of them, I did not know what the story was going to be. Um, and once I do, then it comes in a kind of thrilling rush. The first novel that I wrote uh, when I was 27, a novel called Baby Love, um, I was supporting our family as a writer, um, mostly for women's magazines. My, my husband was a painter who wasn't selling his paintings, um, a little bit like somebody else in my <laughs> history. Um, um, and I, I, I had um, I'd been sent off to, to interview the, the writer Ann Beatty. And I, I loved Ann Beatty's writing, and I so admired her, and I was writing for Women's Day and Family Circle and Good Housekeeping, and I came home, and I put my head in my hands, just feeling so sad that I wasn't writing novels. And, 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 but I, I didn't have the luxury of doing something that wasn't going to deliver a check really quickly. And, and my husband said, oh, you know, why don't you just you know, uh, stop complaining and just do it? And, but I, I knew I didn't have a lot of time to take off from my other work. So I decided, Ann Beatty had told me that she'd, she'd written this most recent book of hers in eight weeks, and I thought I could maybe afford three weeks. And I, I put my daughter into pretty heavy-duty daycare, something I didn't normally do, and I just sat down and said, I'm going to write a novel. Um, I had the additional motivation. My husband, I really wanted to have another baby, and my husband said he couldn't afford it. And I thought, I'm going to write a novel. I'm going to earn a baby. And I began to think, <laughs> literally, I mean, this was, I didn't know how to write a novel. Nobody ever told me how to do it. I was a college dropout. And I, but I did, I think, instinctively, I followed some very good directions, one of which was to 
to embrace my obsessions, which in those, at that point, one of my obsessions was babies and parenthood and the extraordinary transformation of my life that had occurred when, when I had my first child. And, and I was living in a little t kind of wrong side of the tracks town in New Hampshire. And, and, I, was, and I was carrying that story of my own 18-year-old heartbreak. And you know, whether we write fiction or nonfiction, our story is woven all through it. If you know my story and then you go back, I'm not recommending that you do this, and read every novel of mine, you'll see the, the themes of my life come up again and again. So I wrote a story about a, a heartbroken young woman who goes off to a cabin in New Hampshire alone after a disastrous love affair ends with a much older man. And there, and that was sort of the end of the similarity of my life. But, the, but she encounters a whole bunch of teenage mothers with kind of cr crazy stories and babies. And, and, and I wrote that book in, in uh, partly because I didn't know how to make time pass in a novel. I decided I'm going to make this, write this novel sort of in real time. So the novel will go about as long as my day. So the, the, the novel all spins out over 10 days, and I wrote it in about 10 days. And that was my novel, Baby Love, which did earn me my, my son, Charlie. Um, whose <laughs> who, who's 29th birthday is today, actually. Um, um, and that has continued to be my method. And it's, it's, it does not mean, incidentally, that if you can write a novel in 10 days that you can write 36 in a year. Because I think the, the process of silence and of preparing to write, um, though it doesn't, it doesn't look as if anything is happening, um, has to be honored in a writer's life. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm, that I'm in one of those right now, because I'm not writing right now. But I, I believe that when the moment is right, then I will really write. And that's always how it's been. Um, my, my most recent novel, um, The Good Daughters, was written um, over the space of three weeks in a, at a writer's retreat in Wyoming, a wonderful place called Ucross. And I, I flew up to Ucross sort of thinking, I have no idea what I'm going to do in that cabin in Wyoming when I get to that cabin in Wyoming. But, but for me, it's a sort of, it's a bit that, you know, build that field and the, and the ball game will come. Um, probably the most thrilling experience of that was the novel before, which I, I think is here in, in paperback now, and the one that's going to be made into a film, Labor Day. I had gone to the McDowell Colony in New Hampshire um, to write, and I spent six weeks I, of a two-month residency writing a memoir um, about, uh, it's a sort of picking up after A Home in the World um, memoir that I finished. It has not been published. It's sort of sitting, waiting for resolution because my life didn't have it at that point. And I had 10 days left at the McDowell Colony and I, I couldn't bear to waste those 10 days so I decided I'm going to write a novel in 10 days. And Labor Day weekend was coming up and I decided that I would write a novel set over the course of a long, hot New Hampshire Labor Day weekend. And I woke up the next, I actually said a prayer when I went to bed uh, that the story would come and I woke up and, and there was amazingly the voice of a 13 year old boy something, someone I've never been, almost dictating this story to me. But if you look at Labor Day, in fact, you'll see all my obsessions again coming up, but in a surprising voice. The boy lives with a, a, a single mother in a small New Hampshire town. Guess what I used to be? She, unlike me, is a very unsociable person. She's just about agoraphobic. But um, he persuades her to go out back to school shopping right before school begins. And, and she takes him <coughs> to the Price Mart. He's outgrowing all his clothes. And there at the big <coughs> store, um, a, a man, a bleeding man, comes up to them and says, would you help me? Um, I, I can, will you take me back to your house? And amazingly, to many readers, this woman says yes and brings the man back to her house. And a love affair unfolds between these two very unlikely characters, witnessed through the eyes of the 13-year-old boy. Um, uh, writers, readers of that book always say, um, and, and it's a book that people do tend to love and sort of not put down, um, but they do say, I couldn't believe that woman would bring home that man. I've never known somebody who would do such a thing. And I say to them, well, actually, I do know somebody who would probably have done such a thing. Once a trusting person, always a trusting person. But, but the obsessions of, um, I go back to teenagers a lot, and I know why. Because my own teenage years shaped me in a very deep, well, who could not say that? Um, and, I, and, I, uh, and I was the mother of sons. And I was the mother of sons <coughs> trying to navigate the, you know, that sort of uncharted territory between being a parent and being a, a sexual person. Um, and all of those themes and obsessions. Um, um, the, the, the person, the seemingly 
good person that turns out to be very bad and the seemingly bad person who turns out to be very good. Um, pie is even in, I, I happen to be a, a pie baker and a pie teacher. If you Google pie, my name will come up, not so far down the list. And embedded in that novel um, are perfect instructions on how to make um, a, a good pie crust, um, if you follow them. And they come, uh, they come in the voice of the, the bleeding man. I, I, I might seem to have gotten away from your question, only to say that what I do is I get into a very quiet room where no child is going to have a crisis or a problem for, and I, I, that's why I write the books fast, because I know that very soon one of them will. <laughs> and I let my life sort of pour over me, and the things that have moved me most profoundly, and, and a voice starts to talk. And, it, and that it's a, it's a scary thing to not know where it's going to come from. But when you've been doing it for 40 years, you do begin to trust that it, it will continue. It will, it will happen again. And, and partly I write them fast because I always want to know how the book's going to turn out. And the only way to find out is to finish it. Yes? Um, well, and you did just tell something, but it's okay. <laughs> it's, you should still get the book. <laughs> I don't believe in writing a book that's all about like a trick, so it's fine. It's fine. Um, you know, what matters most to me is what you think. I have my ideas, but um, the book, is that The Good Daughters, is narrated in the voice of, of two women who grew up in two very different households. And we, we watch them grow over the course of 50 years. And, and we see their lives sort of intersect. And we see a troubling, confusing relationship between these two families. And I, I do not give the answer because those two women only have access to their truth. Um, when I teach, I talk a lot about point of view. It is not for me, when I write at home in the world, to ever say what my ex-husband was thinking what my mother was thinking, what Salinger was thinking, what my children were thinking. I can only tell, I cannot write the truth, I can only tell my truth. So we can see what Ruth thinks, we can see what Dana thinks, um, but I live through them and I don't want to impose sort of my global godlike understanding of the story. Um, I actually, one of the great things that happens to me as a writer, and I don't know if, if any of the other writers that, that you've heard from in this series have said this, but it is one of the greatest joys a writer can know, is that I discover things in the act of writing about my own characters that I wasn't anticipating. And it happens every time. They, you know, it's, again, I seem to be going back to the, the metaphor of, of parenthood. I, I can guess why, because it's been a big part of my life. Um, you, you give birth to a child, you raise a child, and at first you think naively that you are going to, you know, you'll pick out their outfits and you'll decide what foods they eat and who their friends are and, you know, what nursery school they go to. And very soon they begin to tell you who they are, which may not, that may be very disconcerting sometimes. They're not who you thought they were going to be. And, but that's also the joy, both of parenthood and of creating characters. So I set these two women, in the case of The Good Daughters, I was thinking about it because I set these two women into motion without entirely knowing what was going to happen. Or in fact, not knowing at all, to go back to your question. I didn't know, this had never happened to me before, but I, I, I have these two women and their first little girls and then they're teenagers. And round about page, I don't know, 65, I realized one of them was gay. I'd never written a gay character before. I hadn't, it, I, I'm, I'm not gay, but I, I trusted. She had taken on a life of her own, and I thought, how interesting. And I was a little scared. Will I be able to portray this character in a believable way? But I'd already been a 13-year-old boy. I'd been a murderer. I'd been many different things. So I, I and she had, she, she told me what she would say. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, what was that? Yes. And I respect that enormously, and no, the answer is no. I, um, I, 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 not that I have met people like the characters that I've, that I've, 
put on the page. But I tend to, I need to know a world so organically that I don't have to consult my notes. Um, it would be for me like trying to dance well or make love well or, or sing well and sort of go back to you know, the book and see how you do it. I have to, I, I have, to have it, the characters very much inside me before, um, before I feel I know them well enough to. Um, and, and that even has to do with geography. I haven't set um, a novel. One time I set a novel in a state that I hadn't really lived in, and that was Montana. And I'd spent time in, I, it was actually originally set in Alberta, um, a place that I did know and had spent time. And my American publisher said, people aren't going to read a book set in Canada. And so I had to find the state most like Alberta. <laughs> um, and that turned out to be Montana, I was told. <laughs> and, and people in Alberta said, oh, right, Montana. We always get that. Um, <laughs> but mostly, even though I have lived in California for 16 years now, I tend to still set my fiction in New Hampshire because I can just smell New Hampshire. I'm, I'm just getting to the point where I could do California, um, I think. Although, um, I think if you come from a small place and a place that, that not so many other people do come from, I'm always going to be drawn to, to probably setting my work there. But no, I'm not, I'm not a researcher, I have to say. Um, my novel, To Die For, was inspired loosely by a, a pretty notorious murder case that was going on in the state of New Hampshire that particular day that I sat down saying, I think I want to write a novel and didn't know what it was going to be about. It was the Pamela Smart case, which if you had lived in New England in the year 1992, probably no, 1990, um, you would have heard about. A very pretty, blonde, sort of ex-cheerleader um, woman with aspirations to be a, a, a TV anchor woman, but teaching media at a local high school, had enlisted, who seemed to have that sort of perfect life, ding dong, my, my, um, my themes and obsessions, um, enlisted the aid of her 15-year-old lover to murder her husband. That was the part that I read in the newspaper. And I did go to her arraignment because I just wanted to, that resonated, that story resonated for me, which tells more about me than about the story, probably. I, I know when my own obsessions and story are touched off by some other story that I hear about, and that was one. Um, so I went to that arraignment because I wanted to just see her. I wanted to watch her <coughs> live. But I did not want to interview her or any member of her family. And I then took pains to sort of stay away from the facts of the case because I wanted, uh, first of all, I knew that the truth would not be revealed in the pages of the newspaper. The big question for me that, that compelled me to write To Die For was how, what would inspire a 15-year-old boy to shoot point blank um, a man he didn't even know? And I did not believe that if I got an interview with that boy in the um, New Hampshire State Prison that he was going to tell me the answer. Um, but I thought if I, this situation I've mentioned before, if I gave birth to a character and I, and I let him live on the page for a while, he would bring me to the answer. And he did. I didn't want to create a monster. I wanted to create a character who, for whom I could feel compassion, a character who w we wouldn't find his act forgivable, but we would understand how he could have gotten to that point. And about 120 pages into it, after I'd seen that boy, real wrong side of the tracks boy of a sort that I, I knew well from my home state of New Hampshire, seeing that golden, perfect, blonde teacher, specifically the leg of that teacher emerging from her fancy car on day one of school. And then he gets invited over to her house, and, and she says, show me your tattoo. And he flexes his muscle to do that. And 20 pages later, she's, she's saying, why don't you kiss me? That, and 100 pages later, she says, you know, uh, he's having sex for the first time. And 100 pages later, she's saying, you know, we could always be together if you just got rid of my husband. I, I was ready to write the scene where he pulled the trigger. Um, and that's pretty much always my process of, of letting I, I don't research the facts of a character, but very conveniently, my whole life is my research. So every person I meet, I'm taking them in in a way that might be a little unnerving to some people. <laughs> yes? <laughs> Very good question. And you know, this is one of the big questions that the students that I, that I work with when I teach memoir 
um, struggle with a lot. And I cannot give them the answer for their own life. I can only tell you a little bit about mine. And it is one of the big questions. And I'll, I'll just begin by saying that as, as uncomfortable as it is um, to tell the truth on the page, I have come to feel there's nothing else that merits telling. Um, if you're going to be careful and polite and tiptoe around certain people because you don't want to offend them, you should find another line of work. And I'd say the same to a portrait painter who feels a need to take 20 pounds off a subject. You know, um, I mean, maybe if, if he's a commercial portrait painter and he's not going to get paid any other. But if you want to tell a real story, I don't think a reader deserves anything less than the truth. Um, as it happens, my parents were dead. Um, that it was both um, lucky for my writing, I suppose, and unlucky for my life that my I was quite young when both of my parents were dead. But even that doesn't really answer the question because I still adore my parents. And I, even after their death, I felt a responsibility um, not to betray them in certain ways. But you know, I have this sort of faith that if you write out of love and forgiveness, that comes through on the page. I always ask people, um, who read at home in the world. I, I spend less time sort of hearing about Salinger than um, what did you think about my mother? Because you could read this book and you could say, and you wouldn't be wrong, this woman did outrageous things to her daughter. She did, uh, she was a, you know, a, 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 a deeply flawed mother, damaging mother in so many ways. And when I ask that question, what did you think about my mother? People always say, what an amazing woman. And that's not, you know, what a perfect mother, what a great, but what an amazing woman. And, and that's, that, that's the true story. I, you know, there was a, I had pretty much raised my children, I think in response to the way I was raised, um, talking pretty openly about kinds of things that a lot of parents don't talk openly about. So my children were inoculated against shock in all kinds of ways. Um, and, and things that other people might say, oh, that's too embarrassing. We, talked about kind of freely. Um, and I felt in doing that, I hoped, and it seems to be confirmed so far in, in the openness with which they lead their own creative lives, that that, that freed them to do the same. But there, there was a particular story that I had never told um, my children, in particular my son Charlie. And I'll mention this just as a kind of an example, very briefly. Um, as I say, At Home in the World is about a lot more than Salinger. It's really about my coming of age as a, as a young woman and as a writer. It's about growing up in an alcoholic family. It's about the, the um, breakdown of a marriage and, and the survival after the marriage. Um, and ultimately, I would say it's about freeing oneself from the identity of a pleaser to being somebody who doesn't anymore look to anybody to give her approval. But, but there was one particular story that I'd never told my son Charlie, and it had to do with Charlie's birth. All three of my children were born at home in our little house way deep in the country in New Hampshire. And the night that Charlie was born, uh, um, I was in a, a pretty problematic marriage in lots of ways to a brilliant, fascinating man who was kind of a difficult person to be married to, something he could probably say about me too. Um, and the night that he was born, um, I didn't know this was going to be the night that he was born, um, I got a, got a telephone call saying that my father was dying in uh, Canada. My father, my alcoholic father, had gone on a bender and was got pneumonia and was not going to live through the night. And I put down the phone and I became violently ill and, and had all kinds of terrible symptoms. I thought I was going to die. And I got up, I lay down, I got up, I lay down. Um, and suddenly I realized in the middle of my terrible symptoms that in fact I was giving birth to a baby. I had completely missed, the, I, I hadn't missed the pregnancy, I should say. I, I knew I was pregnant. <laughs> but I had completely missed that I, was, that I was in fact in labor. I just thought I was grieving over my father. And all of a sudden I saw I was having a baby that minute. This doesn't usually happen, I will say to the men in the room, but, but this was a kind of dramatic thing. And I said, oh my gosh, the baby's being born. We definitely did not have time to call a midwife. At which point my husband said, my ex-husband, <laughs> I'll tell you now, said, I think I'll just have a cigarette. <laughs> so he walks out of the house, and we can now laugh, but it wasn't funny at the time, I'll tell you. And he walks out into the snow, and I... I'm down in labor about, you know, a head sort of crowning. I won't get too graphic, but, and I'm down on that, and I'm actually crawling after him saying, come back, come back. And he says, Joyce, you know, get a grip. You're hysterical. And, and he goes out and has a cigarette, and I kind of keep it together until I'm sure he didn't enjoy his cigarette. 
I have to add here, my husband didn't smoke. Um, it, like he occasionally smoked, but just in moments of stress. So he came back, and Charlie was born, and he delivered the baby and checked for the cord, and my daughter came home the next, it came, not home, she was six years old, came down the next morning and said, oh, you know, my baby brother got uh, born and everybody was happy. And the, the story, to talk about, you know, history and storytelling and the way memory, you know, plays and the way being a writer and a storyteller, the story that became the family story about Charlie's birth was this great thing that Steve single-handedly had delivered Charlie and checked for the cord, and, and, and the children told it over and over again. I had to, like, hear that story. And I carried a deep bitterness and anger towards my husband. And I used to say to him, Gibbs, please say you were sorry. Uh, um, and it was, it was a really hard thing to get over. I had another whole baby partly to get over. I, would, I wanted the other baby anyway. But, <laughs> but um, and it certainly wasn't the reason for the divorce, but it was a big, I don't know that I ever fully trusted him again. And I don't believe I forgave him. And I probably punished him plenty for that night, which I realized was, in fact, 29 years ago last night. Um, <laughs> and I had never told that story, because I really did think that that would be a hurtful story. But it, and it was not a story to tell a six-year-old boy or a 10-year-old boy or a 12-year-old boy. But at the point, I will get to your point in a second, I swear to you. My ex-husband used to say, cut to the chase, Joyce. You can also see why we aren't married anymore, because I never <laughs> cut to the chase. Um, <laughs> at the point that I was writing at Home in the World, which was in many ways about what happened, um, Charlie was 16 years old. And in fact, that story explained some of the things that he already did know, like his mother's bitterness towards his father and the bitterness of that divorce. And, and who, who he had lived with the fallout of so much without understanding some of the origins. And so I did decide to tell him that story. And I, I didn't want to tell him in a big sort of melodramatic way of look what a bad guy he was. So it, I, I, I did it in the place that I've always found to be the best place to have a conversation with a child about a difficult thing, which is in the car while it's moving. <laughs> so we were on the highway, and I couldn't look at him because I have to be driving, and he can't get away because we're on the highway. And I say in this very kind of flat, you know, like, Charlie, there's a story that, you know, I, I certainly didn't want him to read it first in a book that I knew. And truthfully, and I think this is a difference between women writers and men writers, that if Charlie, had, if Charlie was going to say to me, Mom, don't publish that story, I wouldn't have. Because I think most female writers will be, will be loyal to family over their career and their work in ways that, that um, the Norman Mailer, as much as I adored Norman Mailer, probably don't have to be and are not expected to be. Um, but I told him that story, you know, Charlie, the night you were born, there was a little you know, thing I never told you, and here's what happened, and you know, your dad wanted a cigarette, and he came back and you were born. And when I was all done, I was just, my stomach was tied up in knots. I'd been preparing for this for days and thinking about it and discussing it with my friends. Can I tell Charlie the story or not? And when I was all done telling the story, Charlie looked at me and he said, sounds like dad, mom. <laughs> and he loves his dad as well he should. He loves his dad. But he doesn't love his dad for any illusion that his dad is the person you'd want to be with in a cabin in New Hampshire giving birth in the middle of a winter, you know, <laughs> all by yourself. Um, you know, maybe you'd want to be if you were like on top of snow mass and your ski broke and you were, and a blizzard was coming. But, um, so I believe in the truth. And I believe the truth will set you free. Is that one more question you were saying? Yes. Is there one more question? If there's not, I'm going to read you a very, a very short thing from the end. Um, actually, a great thing about a paperback edition of a book is that when the paperback comes out, you get to have the last word on, the, on what the critics have said. And um, At Home in the World, as I, uh, as I mentioned, was a much embattled book. Of the hundreds and hundreds of reviews that were published about this book, it was hard to find a good one. And people you know, called me a, a predator for writing about Salinger, an exploitive of this great writer. I was betraying his privacy, many other things. And, and it was a, it, it, if there was ever a moment for me to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, it probably was the fall of 1998 when this book was published. And some pretty rough things were said about me. Um, but 
a year later, the, the paperback came out, and I was able to write um, an afterword to the book in which I addressed some of the, the criticisms of me about having told this you know, forbidden story. Um, and I'm going to read you just a couple of paragraphs, one of which I cannot take credit for because it was written by my youngest son, Will, who just turned 27, actually. Um, but he was then, I think, 14 years old. So I'll, um, I'll just read uh, a little prelude to it. Recently, a woman posted an indignant message to me on the discussion forum of my website, asking how I could live with myself, knowing that one day my children were likely to read at home in the world. Willie was in the room at the time, so I read her question out loud to him. Mind if I answer that, he said. Word for word, here is the note he dashed off to her. Oh, Kathy. I love that. <laughs> he is a writer, my son. Oh, Kathy. I have read my mother's most recent book, and though parts were hard to hear, I was glad to read every page of it. I am sure that in your own life, you too have been faced with adversity and pain that affected you profoundly, as has my mother. The fact that she chose to express hers in writing is, I believe, a sign of her strength and an expression of the faith she has in her children. And that is true. I am the youngest of my siblings and possibly the least mature. However, not for a moment do I suspect any conflicting feeling from my fellow siblings when I say that we all love and support our mother despite her zany stories of despair and woe. I think that's what it should say on the cover, <laughs> zany stories of despair and woe. I think that we can all relate and learn from these tales if they are approached with an open mind and, in my case, a little love. Sincerely, Stephen Wilson Bethel. Um, <clears throat> so, um, um, thank you so much for coming. What a wonderful series you run, when how, how lucky you are to live in a town that supports writers this way. And, and um, I'll hope I get to come back here someday. It's always a pleasure.